So I'm Tim Terryberry. I'm going to talk about DALA one year later, as everyone observed last year. I didn't even have to change the title slide. And all right. So the the original plan, is, as we discussed last year, was that we were going to finish DALA by the end of 2015. And we concluded at VDD last year that obviously wasn't going to happen. But it did. <laughs> Oops. So, um, so there was this thing called the Alliance for Open Media that was formed, and we got together in, in the beginning of February and decided that, that we were going to uh, start developing a combined codec um, based on VP9 um, and incorporating technology from DALA and Thor and VP10. Um, so we have moved most of our main development over to AV1. Um, we are still using DALA as a research testbed, so the project is not actually dead. Um, it may have future life as a still image codec, um, and there are also plenty of techniques in DALA that, that we think are not ready for AV1 now, um, but they may mature over time and become more compelling, so we will continue to work on them. So last year we discussed a VDD. We only had 32 by 32 transforms in motion compensation. Um, we had multiple reference frames, but no B frames. We had a, a bilinear loop filter um, and a deringing filter, and we had this wonderful problem that, that when we do our motion search, we didn't actually bother to consider whether or not we were going to use an intramode, so sometimes we would predict a whole bunch of stuff with, with motion vectors and then throw it all away. So what progress did we make? Um, now we have 64 by 64 transforms in motion compensation. Um, we, we have basic MPEG-2 style B-frames. Um, there's no bi-prediction mode and no direct mode, um, not because I think there's any fundamental problem with those, but because I, we haven't read a whole bunch of patents yet. Um, we actually got rid of our bilinear loop filter, and I'll talk a little bit more about that why later, and we made our deringing filter much more hardware friendly, but we still have no intramode consideration in our motion search. So there were, however, another, a number of other major developments. Um, so we handle frame padding much better than we did before. Um, we have this thing called full precision references, um, which is similar to 10-bit internal and things like that that you've seen in other codecs. Um, we have a brand new transform coefficient coder, which I'll talk about all of those things in a bit more detail. Um, and then there are some other things that I, I will not talk about because we only have a limited time together. Um, our fixed point PVQ implementation is, is really almost done for real. I think there's like one or two float operations left. Um, so th thank you to Tristan Matthews who could not be here because of a wedding, but he is the one who did all of that work. Um, we have rate control now. Um, it's the same rate control that was in Theora forward ported to handle additional frame types. Um, and we'll be looking to move that to AV1. Um, we have much better chroma quality. Again, that was somebody who, who came in and said, all your colors are awful, let me do a whole bunch of work to make them better, and he did, and they are. Um, and we also had a bunch of encoder tuning and better SIMD optimizations and all those sorts of things that you do when you're making a codec. So let's talk about 64 by 64 motion compensation. Um, so as you may recall, um, the way motion compensation works in DALA is that we have OBMC with restrictions on the sizes of your neighbors. So a given neighboring block size must be within a factor of two of all of its neighbors. Um, in order to actually enforce that restriction, we do some complicated RDO scheme that uses you know, giant tables. And every time we add an additional level to the hierarchy, these tables get exponentially bigger. And so moving from 16 by 16 max up to 32 by 32 was a whole lot of work because we had to redo, expand all of these tables. And I said, no, no, the next time I'm going to write a program to generate all these things. Um, but then we tested and found that just disabling 4 by 4 motion compensation was an improvement. So we just scaled all the tables up. And now we have 64 by 64 and didn't have to do any work. So that gave us a 6% improvement on all metrics. Um, except for fastest as I am down there at the bottom, but most of the metrics. So that was great. I like things that are easy. Um, then we did something that was very hard, which was add 64 by 64 transforms. Um, so this is a whole 
ton of, of very nitpicky work to actually get a fixed point implementation that's completely reversible and orthonormal and has all these wonderful properties like all of our other transforms. And when we did all of that, we got between one and one and a half percent, which was a little bit disappointing. But we have these transforms now, um, and they, they did give some good visual improvements. Um, but now we have another problem, which is that now we have 64 by 64 padding. And that's particularly a problem because our transform coding doesn't understand that regions are padding um, because it's hard to figure out in, when you have part of a block which part of your basis function corresponds to padding and which doesn't because it's just one frequency coefficient that spans the whole block. Um, our motion compensation, however, was smart. Um, it does the same things you, you, you heard Alex talk about in libvpx, where if, if there are prediction errors outside of the visible region of the frame, then we ignore them. So we would get huge prediction errors outside the visible region of the frame, and then we would send them to our transform layer, which would try to code them. So that wasn't good. Um, however, we had a very simple way to fix this, which is just after motion compensation, we take all the stuff that we had all the pixels that we had used as padding during our motion search and just replace them with the output of the motion search. So now when we send it to the transform stage, like the error in the prediction in all those regions is exactly zero. And it turns out like this saved us all of the bits that we were wasting in these padding regions and we got even, even more gains there than we got from going to 64 by 64 transforms. So that was great. We don't have to worry about any of these like splitting down things on the edges of blocks and, and special casing all of how all of that is coded and looking at all of the IPR that around how that's done in HEVC. Um, so finally we added full precision references. So these are currently off by default because they make everything much, much slower. Um, but you know, we, with proper SIMD optimization and maybe some smarter optimizations, we can probably get that down into a reasonable complexity level, but we haven't done all of that work. Um, so DALA always operates on transform coefficients that have 12-bit precision. So the way that works is when we have 8-bit inputs that come out of our motion estimation, we shift everything up by 4 bits, and then we send them into our transforms. Um, so we used to shift the output of the inverse transform back down to 8 bits, and then send that back and store it as a reference frame for predicting future frames, which you know, saves a bunch of memory on, on these 12-bit coefficient values, but that, that conversion down adds a bunch of rounding noise, which hurts coding efficiency. So for full precision references, we just stop converting back to 8 bits, um, which is conceptually very simple, and saves us between 2 and 2.5% 2 and on bit rate, essentially for free, um, except for all that memory. Um, as, as you may recall, we have this wonderful directional deringing filter, which we explained at a previous VDD, so I won't go over all of that again. But you see it, it smooths things along nice directions, um, usually not as much as that. <laughs> but since we are part of the Alliance for Open Media, and the Alliance for Open Media has a bunch of, of hardware companies in it, they gave us useful feedback on, on where we could improve our filter for hardware. Um, so. The filter has, has a bunch of threshold calculations in it, and one of the, the calculations we were doing was something that depended on an average value that we measured over an entire 64 by 64 superblock. And the hardware people said, that's great, but we can't actually filter the bottom row of superblocks until we undo the loop filter from the previous stage. So, so if you make, make us do that, we have to delay all of our processing by an entire superblock row and buffer 64 lines of data you know, in, in basically in local registers and hardware, which is hugely expensive. So they said, stop doing that. So we stopped doing that. And it had basically no impact on quality, so everybody was happy. Um, then, then we looked at the, the 45 degree direction case. Um, and basically, after you do the first filter, we do a second filter, which we could I arbitrarily choose to either process things horizontally or process things vertically. And we said, well, processing things vertically is much easier for SIMD because we can just line up all of our registers and do, do loads from SIMD without any transposes or any other horrible things. So we went that way at first, and then the hardware people said, well, if you do that, that requires an extra line buffer on the top and the bottom. So we said, okay, we'll go the other way. And that makes the software a little bit harder, but, but not really much to matter, but it does save two line buffers in the hardware, which they were very happy about. Um, Finally, we had in our direction search where we try to figure out what is the local orientation of each of these blocks. 
we do a bunch of averaging of pixels along various lines in those directions, and the number of pixels we have in each of those lines varies between 1 and 8. So when we compute the averages, we divide between the values 1 to 8. Um, in practice, we implemented all of that with multiplies, but, but the Harper people were like, then it's still kind of expensive. Can you do something about that? And it turned out that we can just multiply everything by the least common multiple instead of doing divisions. And the multiplies are much smaller because the constants involved are much smaller. And everything still fits in 32 bits. And so the quality actually got better because now we have no rounding errors at all because everything winds up being exact arithmetic. Um, so that made everybody happy. Um, Finally, we also made some other changes to the filter, such as changing the filter taps from, from something that was, looks more like a pure low pass to a little bit more of a triangular shaped filter. And that had nothing to do with hardware, it just gave better results. So, as I said at the beginning, we have this, this bilinear loop filter, um, which as you may recall from a previous uh, presentation, was designed to get rid of, of some of these blocking artifacts that we got when we went to um, smaller lapping sizes, as you can see in the picture there at the bottom. Um, so we got rid of it. And the reason we got rid of it is once we added 64 by 64 transforms and made some of these improvements to the deringing filter, we, we actually found that it was hurting quality and in, in most cases. Um, and so just throwing away code made the, made the codec better, which always makes us happy. Um, and finally, as I, as I said, we have a new coefficient coder. So I'm sure all of you remember exactly how PVQ works with the hyperspheres and, and the, the householder reflections and all of that. Um, but for the purposes of actually coding the coefficients, all you need to know is that, that the, one of the things that we know going into PVQ is the total sum of the absolute values of all those coefficients because that comes out as part of the, the the gain and theta parameters that we code as PVQ. Um, if we were going to do a similar coefficient coding for scalar quantization, you would have to actually code that value up front, but that's actually probably perfectly doable. But once you know that sum of absolute values of all your coefficients, what we do is split our coefficient vector in half. So we have now a sum of, of absolute values of the first half of the vector and a sum of absolute values of the second half vector, which we call k left and k right. Um, and then we code k right. And so that tells you how much of that sum is distributed in one half versus the other. And given, given the value of k, we know there are k plus one possible values for k right. Um, but k can be pretty large, um, especially at, at high rates or in blocks where you have a lot of stuff going on. So while we, we do have a nice entropy coder that can take, you know, binary, or take alphabets that are larger than binary, so we can code values that are larger than two. Um, we don't want to code arbitrarily large values. So instead, what we do is say, well, if k is larger than seven, we just code the top three bits of k right um, using the entropy coder, and then code everything else just as raw bits, because it's probably not going to save you very much to entropy code all of that anyway. Um, and we pick a context based on, on the vector dimension, so like the size of the band that we're encoding and, and the number of, of top bits of K that we used. Um, and then all of this recurses, right? So you split down your vector piece by piece until you basically get down to a single coefficient and then you know exactly what its absolute value is. Um, with one special case, which is the special case when we get down to we only have when the total absolute value in some set of coefficients is, is known to be one, and the number of, of, of places that, that one could possibly go is less than or equal to 16, which is the maximum amount we can code with our entropy coder, we just say, here's where it goes. Just put this exactly in this position. Um, and so that saves coding a bunch of symbols in that case, and so we have a, bunch, a different set of contexts for that based on, again, the vector dimension um, and whether or not you had to split down to get to that size or whether your vector originally started out that size. Um, so, and then finally we code all the signs for these coefficients with just raw bits. Again, no entropy coding. Um, and so this is vastly simpler than the stuff we were doing before in that it actually fits on two slides. 
Um, the stuff we were doing before had like this exponentially decaying probability model with, with divisions and, and all these other horrible things. And we're like, we knew we would have to simplify it at some point in the future, and this is the simplified version. Like, you can actually talk about it and reason about it. Um, and it worked better, right? So, uh, not hugely better, but, but a little bit better. But we think there's still some room for improvement. Um, so what this plot is showing is, is something that, that Guillaume was working on. Um, this is, is if we took one of the pulses and moved it to a, each position in the vector, um, this is how many bits it would cost to put it there. And this is randomly sampled, so this is just two blocks out of a random frame. Um, but you can see there's a bunch of weird things going on. Like what you would normally expect is, is Positions early in the vector would be cheap, and positions late in the vector would be expensive because we've ordered the thing such a way that 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 you know most of your variants should show up at the beginning of the the scan, and 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 less of the variants at the end of the scan. But that's not the probabilities that we're getting out here. Um, so you can see those nice repeating patterns, and you can see like in the the black curve, there are some spots where it's actually cheaper to put things part way through the vector than at the beginning. Um, which all seems a little bit weird, and we have no real explanation for why that's going on. But, but the point is, is, is there's probably room for improvement here in either organizing our context better or adapting probabilities better or something along those lines. But you know, I'm not sure how much room there is. Like all of those things out there in that long tail, you know, you, you got a bunch of those probabilities are certainly wrong, but maybe not wrong enough to matter. And maybe we didn't spend enough bits there that that it actually makes that much difference. But it's interesting to think about nonetheless. Um, the final thing that, that we added to the coefficient coder is this idea of dyadic probability adaptation. So the way we used to do probabilities is we just did simple frequency counts and we had this, this arithmetic coder that would say, well, regardless of what your probabilities sum up to, I can code them, but in order to do that fast, I have to do some approximations and that adds some bitrate overhead to the tune of around 1%. But if we could say the total was a power of two, then the, we don't have to use any approximations and we don't have to, we can still do everything without divisions, so it's still fast. Um, and so that would save us that 1% overhead. Um, so what we want is an adaptation scheme where we have a fixed total, um, but we need to ensure that no probability goes to zero because if any of the probabilities go to zero, then that's, you know, we can never code that symbol again, and that's bad. So here's how we construct that. So we're gonna fix the total probability um, t at, at some value like 32768, any power of two would work. We're going to subtract a probability floor um, before we do the adaptation. So these are our cumulative distribution functions. So if I wanna set a floor of, of one in each of my possible values, then the, the CDF I want to subtract is just the sum of one, two, three, four, et cetera, up to the total alphabet size, which I'm calling M. Um, in our case, M is always less than or equal to 16, so as long as, that's, as T is greater than or equal to 16, that will always work. Um, and then when we've decoded one of these symbols, we want to blend the existing probability distribution we have with sort of this extreme probability distribution corresponding to the symbol we coded, where we assume that everything that was not the symbol has, has probability zero, and the probability of the symbol is this total t minus m, which is the total after we subtracted out our probability floor. So we can do that blending any way we want. Um, in particular, we do it using weights that are, are some negative power of two and one minus that. Um, just to make all the, the blending easy. Um, and then we add back in this probability floor. So at the end, we get something whose total is still t, and the probability of each of those symbols is, is still at least one. Um, and no matter how you, you round or truncate in your blending step, then, then everything still works. Um, but this is a little bit expensive. So we simplify it. And this doesn't actually look simpler, but <laughs> trust me, it is. Um, so basically what happens, there are two cases. Um, we're going to update all of, of the, the frequencies in our, in our cumulative distribution function. 
So that those are each called fi here. If, if i is less than the value that we coded or decoded, um, then we apply the first case. And if it's greater than equal to, to the value we coded or decoded, we apply the second case. And the second case just has a whole bunch of, of random junk in it, which sends the probabilities in the right way. But the important observation here is that all of that random junk is essentially constants. So the total probability is a constant. The alphabet size is a constant. The symbol index we're updating is a constant, and the, the adaptation rate is a constant. So we can just make tables for all of this stuff. And then it winds up being the fi values there plus some constant, um, then shifted over to the right by some value, and then subtracted from the original fi values. So it's three vector operations, which is actually quite cheap. Um, it's basically the same as doing frequency counts if you had to do a rescaling operation. Um, so we actually, we also changed the adaptation rate a little bit for the first few symbols in, in a, coded in a given context to help speed up adaptation. And we're still working on exactly the right way to do that. But you put all this together and we wound up converting it for the, the coefficient coder and, and a few other symbols that we code, but not even the whole codec. And we saved half a percent, which is you know half of the overhead that we were spending on our, our approximation. So we were really happy about that. Um, we spoke with some hardware folks at Google, and they said that that you know this this probably seems okay to them to implement in hardware. So we're going to try to get this integrated into AV1, so we can do all this nice fast adaptation in, in non-binary arithmetic coding in in AV1. So. These are, in fact, all of the things that we're currently working on getting into AV1. Um, so the directional deringing filter, it's fully symbiable, has good perceptual improvements. This is already integrated. It's giving us about a percent and a half gain on PSNR, which we weren't even trying to get um, on, on high delay content, and like three and a half percent if you do a low delay configuration. Um, as I said, we're going to try to get all this nine binary arithmetic coding stuff in. Um, just because it gives you small effective parallelism, so that should make the hardware guys happy. Um, still not sure exactly which underlying coding engine we're going to use, either the one from DALA or the, the RANS stuff that Alex is working on. Again, that's a function of which one the hardware guys say is actually acceptable. Um, and finally, we think this PVQ stuff is great, um, so we've started integrating that, and that has been a huge slog. Um, because it turns out that, that VP9 is very complicated, and particularly VPX is very complicated. Um, but, but we've made some good progress. Um, so right now, we aren't even trying to do any of the perceptual stuff. We're just doing you know, flat quantization, no activity masking, and already showing some small gains uh, versus scalar quantization um, in the range of 2% of on still images and 1% on video. Um, and so we hopefully will be able to improve that slightly. Um, currently is also, however, very slow, so we need to work on that a bit. Um, but once we get that in, we, there is some pot potential for large perceptual improvements. Um, so once we start turning on things like activity masking and non-flat quantization matrices, we should be able to see some, some huge gains in the perceptual metrics and not just the one or 2% on PSNR we're seeing now. Um, and also getting that in enables things like doing frequency domain chroma from Luma and, and other techniques that, that you know, come from predicting things in the frequency domain. And finally, as I mentioned back in the beginning of the presentation, um, we would like to get rate control improvements in, which I'm sure will make plenty of people here very happy. So uh, some summaries of our progress and metrics on DALA. So these results are, are from April, um, because as I said, in, in basically in February, we switched most of our development over. And this was roughly the last time we actually measured this stuff. Um, I think we may have improved 1% or 2% from there, just from minor changes, but, but nothing major. Um, so you can see the sort of the golden line at the top there is where DALA was in April. Um, it actually winds up matching H265, which in the particular the X265 implementation, um, all the way down to the low bit rates. In, in the sweet spot, according to this metric at least, it was actually slightly better. Um, this is a, a different perceptual metric, PSNR HVS, that we use. And on this one, it shows us as being uh, a bit worse than than x265, but the reality is, again, probably somewhere in between those two. 
Um, metrics can only tell you so much. But given all of the problems that we talked about, like this, like you know, the very limited B frames we have, the the no interim modes and mode decision searches, and all these other immaturities, like we think these results are really pretty promising. So, are there any questions? Um, yeah, so this is not something that we've we've seriously pursued because you know we have a royalty-free image format that won. It's called JPEG. Um, so maybe once we get a, a royalty-free video format that's won, then then we can turn our our attention to doing image stuff. But um, we do think that DALA works particularly well on still images, despite the fact that it has no interprediction to speak of. Um, and, and so we think there's a lot of promise there, especially if we can actually figure out how to make interprediction work. Any other questions? I will assume that's because you all understood everything perfectly. <laughs> oh, you got them? I go, so yeah, so Dahl is done, right? We, we, we stretched it a little bit into January, <laughs> but you know, software always slips, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure that, that the overall project met its goals at the end of 2015, but, but we've moved our efforts over to AV1 to work with everyone else because everyone only wants one codec. All right, anyone else? Okay, thank you very much.